Um, we've got, I see people coming in. So welcome everyone. Welcome to this TechCast Cognis Strategic Forum series. We're delighted that you're joining us for the second of our online strategic forums, Planning for Transformational Change. Welcome. First of all, we want to offer a big thank you to our main sponsors, TechCast Global and Cognis, along with our other sponsors listed on the program, all have made it possible to bring this forum to you without charge. You know, we recognize that this has been a difficult time for many, and we want to do our part to guide and assist you in planning for the major transformations which lie ahead. So in that regard, for those of you who are able, we would greatly appreciate a donation in any amount. Simply go to the link appearing in the chat box below. It would certainly be of great help to us. And to those of you who already have donated, we extend a very special thank you. And also a virtual forum like this needs somebody behind the scenes, turning all the dials, pulling all the levers, helping to keep everything up and running and on track. And for us, that person is TechCast Associate CEO of Hausman Tech, Dr. Steve Hausman. And he's up there in, in your screen. Say hello to us, Steve. Give us a wave. Thank you. There How are you going? Thank you so <laughs> thank you so much, Steve, for helping to make keep all this up You're and running. You're very welcome. Okay. I'm Art Murray, CEO of Applied Knowledge Sciences and Director of the Enterprise of the Future Program at the International Institute for Knowledge and Innovation in Washington, D.C., where we focus on helping knowledge-based enterprises succeed in a complex, rapidly changing world through a process of rapid innovation and learning. I will be your guide and moderator for today's session. Also, as we mentioned at the beginning, this is a community networking and building opportunity. If you haven't already done so, right there in the chat box, we invite you to share your name, organization, where you're from and where you're joining us from. Uh, our inaugural forum a month ago had participants from Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, the Americas, from all over. Um, so we, we look forward to, we see a similar crowd forming uh, this time as well. So please introduce yourself. Each session of our forum consists of, a nine, of 90 minutes of speaker presentations, including a brief period at the end for panel discussions and Q&A. Last month's forum set the stage by building a strong case for the massive global transformations that are coming and how to plan for them. Bill Halal began that session last month by showing how the present system is simply not sustainable and how it's going to require a transformation at the global consciousness level. And it's already in the early stages of formation. Then Jess Garrison showed how strategic foresight needs to be managed both from the bottom up and the outside in. And Hazel Henderson gave a fantastic closing keynote on how the new economic paradigm known as love economics will form the basis for a better, more cooperative and sustainable global consciousness. So tonight's forum builds up on those ideas. And tonight's forum is entitled The Three Futures of COVID-19 Pandemic in the United States, January 1st, 2022. The Millennium Project's Methodology and Lessons Learned. Now, last year, during the height of the pandemic, Michael Kleeman of the American Red Cross said, we're so focused on what we have to do today to respond to COVID that we simply don't have time to think 12 or 18 months down the road, but somebody has to. Well, who better to take on that task than the Millennium Project? Headquartered here in Washington, DC with 67 nodes all around the world, the Millennium Project seeks to improve humanity's prospects for building a better future by improving the way we think about the future and making those new ways of thinking available to everyone. Now, in, in response to the Red Cross's request, the Millennium Project developed three scenarios, a baseline scenario with no surprises, a worst case, and a best case. And they gained some excellent insights in doing that process, which is how they're going to, which is what they'll share. And those insights will show how you and your organization can begin making preparations now 
for whatever threats or opportunities might present themselves uh, at any point in the future. So as part of your, by the way, as part of your registration, each of you should have received a set of read ahead materials, including those three scenarios. So hopefully you've had a chance to go through them. Each member of our expert panel, we have three panelists today, developed one of those scenarios. Our panel of experts is led by Jerry Glenn, CEO and co-founder of the Millennium Project, and he will walk us through the methodology they used in this study. Then Jerry will be joined by Millennium Project co-founder Ted Gordon, who's one of the world's most respected futurists and management consultants, specializing in forecasting, methodology, planning, and policy. And the third member of our panel is Professor Paul Sappho, who once said, in the short term, the pessimists are right. And in the long term, the optimists are right. <laughs> well, I guess there's no doubt as to who they asked to do that third scenario, which is entitled, When Things Go Right. Uh, Paul has spent, Paul has even spent some time among the Mayans in the highlands of the Chiapas, deciphering ancient hieroglyphics, and they express time in billion year scales. So how's that for taking the long view? Now you can read more about the many accomplishments of our three panelists. I'm not going to go any further into that. Uh, we want to definitely hear from them, but uh, their bios are on our program announcement, and you can go to the Millennium Project website. Go to millennium-project.org. That's Millennium Project with a dash in between .org. Now, during the panel presentations, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments by entering them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be watching for that. Um, so I think that takes care of everything. If you're ready, and I know I am, uh, let me now turn the program over to our three panelists, starting with Jerry Glenn. Jerry, the floor is yours. Good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I guess you can see the screen right now, I hope. Yes. Yes, good. All right. Um, the Red Cross uh, representative, uh, friend or acquaintance, Paul Sappho, we were talking and Paul encouraged the, the, the Red Cross representative to uh, contact the Millennium Project and the idea of doing short-term scenarios. And I'm going like, wait a minute, we don't do one to two year scenarios. You know, Ted Gordon and I actually at the year 2000 or 1999, we actually write, wrote thousand year scenarios. Usually it's like 10, 15, 20 years. We've never done anything in this short range, but you couldn't say no. Uh, it was the beginning of the pandemic. It was quite a horrible potential future we were facing. And as the, the host here pointed out, the Red Cross representative, um, uh, Mr. Kleeman was saying, you know, we, we don't have time to look ahead. So would you guys do that? And look ahead, he's talking like six months to a year at this, at this point, uh, because a lot of the, the uncertainties were just extraordinary. I think one of our participants listed something like 29 uncertainties when we began which meant that we couldn't do the normal, conventional, superficial scenario analysis of two, un two uh, unknowns, high and low for each and making a, a, a grid of, of, of four possible futures uh, because we couldn't do it with 29 unknowns. It was just way, way too much. So we uh, organized all these unknowns in, essentially into three categories. We said, Imagine these, th this unknown turns out badly, put it over here. Imagine it turns out okay, put it over here. And then imagine it's a mixed bag, we'll put it in the middle. So we ended up with three conventional scenarios, good, bad, and, and mixed, uh, as a way of organizing all the uncertainties. Each described how the pandemic might evolve, plausible might evolve, out to 22. And we are doing this in, in 2020, so it's a little um, around two years to a year and a half ahead. Uh, we put, we, we, we got input from about 250 uh, medical doctors, public health officials, emergency staff, futurists, economists, and so forth, really a mixed bag, both within the United States and, and outside. We, we did uh, about, we did five real-time Delphi's in different categories. Um, this provided a coherent, integrated, holistic view because as you remember back then in the beginning, you had pieces of information flying at you from all different directions. Here's about unemployment. Here's about it's not contagious. Here's it's very contagious. 
here it's this, here it's that, here it's in China, here it's not. It was just a, a, a snow of, of, of random information. So one of the things we, we the service that we did do is pull all this together into sort of like holistic views. Uh, each is about 10 pages. This is not a superficial analysis. Each one's 10 pages with cause and effect links. A lot of scenarios today really aren't scenarios. They're just sort of like views of different futures. And you say, in this future, how does it work? In this future, how does it work? But they don't tell you how we got there. In these scenarios, we tell you how it got there with cause and effect uh, links and, and potential decisions. Uh, these became useful for planning, but also for public understanding because these uh, were uh, translated into a bunch of languages and circulated around the world. And the quote from uh, the vice, senior vice president, Red Cross, these scenarios are the best integration of medical, health, socioeconomic, and psychological factors of the possible future courses of COVID pandemic that we have. Of course, they might not have had a whole lot of others, so of course it was the best they had. In any case, uh, we started off by picking a team uh, and we wanted to pick a team with diversity, um, not only futurists, but also economists. Uh, um, John Hopkins medical hotshot or medical data guy, uh, the, of course, a Red Cross representative uh, and somebody from who had also been involved in the national intelligence scenarios as well and, and uh, the director of research, the Millennium Project, and also another hotshot educator and, and so, social commentary. Um, we reviewed the research and articles uh, from others. Pause. One of the unique things about this was, let's say if you're doing a scenario on the future of say nanotechnology, there's not that many articles on it. These are sort of limited domain. You can sort of say, I've sort of done it. So the next article you read, you're sort of like, it's repeating what's going on. So you can do a literature search and do a have fairly decent job on something like that. But this was happening in real time, worldwide, and the uncertainties were all over the place. So we had to read our little eyeballs off more than I think any other project I've ever been involved in. And then we shared these things on a listserv and then we discussed them uh, with different experts. So if I didn't understand something, I'd call somebody up and go, what does that mean? Uh, and then once a week, we would have a little meeting and we would discuss all these things. Sort of like we're educating ourselves to create more of a collective intelligence among the team itself. Uh, and then we created a characteristics matrix. What are all those weeks characteristics of those all unknowns? And then how they would fit into the, the, the scenarios as a tool for, for creating the scenarios. And for those that, have never used a characteristic matrix, I would recommend that it helps you to be more complete in your work. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. So we did five real-time Delphi's. Uh, that's a lot in a short period of time, by the way, because uh, we did this over this several months. And um, the, 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 the first one was just medical and health people in the United States. And the second one was medical and health people overseas, because obviously the international affects the United States. Then we did the socioeconomic factors and, and experts in the United States. And then we did the fourth one of overseas socioeconomic experts. And then we did one on uh, a pandemic index, uh, which is still pending for the future at some point. That's, but the, uh, the variables in there have already been assessed. Then we wrote we used all this input to write initial draft scenarios. Then we shared them among each other, among the team. And uh, then we rewrote them based upon that feedback. And then we sent them out to specific experts uh, that we all knew that could give us good feedback. And then that became the final draft scenarios. Um, and they got uh, circulated quite broadly uh, and very pleased to say the Fauci staff circulated them by the Na National uh, Institute of Health, as well as of course, the Red Cross. And then our node uh, chairs around the world circulated some of them. Um, and they were used in conferences and talk shows and PBS and some other places. This is the team that you can see, myself and Ted Gordon, you'll hear in a bit. Uh, Elizabeth Florescu is the director of research. Paul Saffo, you'll hear a little bit later on. Lisa Loop is the one that mentioned a lot of the education and social aspects. Jay Henderson was out of John Hopkins uh, School. And Bannon Garrett is the, the, the gentleman that was uh, involved in the National Institute uh, 
the NIC, the National Intelligence Council's scenarios. Um, Al Watkins is a former economist from the World Bank and does a lot of global economic work and, and, and future solutions work as well. Then Michael Kleeman was a representative from the American Red Cross. The first scenario, America endures. That's both mixed, good and bad. Then the depression, uh, hubris and discourse by Ted, we'll talk about that. And then things go right, everything goes fine. And that's Paul Sappho, uh, we'll talk about that one. Now we used, when I said a holistic approach, what I mean by that is that we not only looked at the medical health thing, what was situated with the vaccines, with the treatments, with testing, contact tracing and so forth. But we also looked at social well-being, not only in hospitals, but also society at large. What were the attitudes, which included the anti-vaccine stuff that's still a problem today. And what was the leadership lacking in the very beginning when we were doing it at the time? And the economic security, there was all kinds of uncertainty about that. And then the economics looked at the business models going out, business is closing down, going out of business, unemployment is going right up, and how is it all gonna be financed? The characteristics matrix, uh, this is a, a good thing for you to do when you do scenarios. It's just a list down all those key things that should be in every scenario. But we also use the same uh, approach for the Delphi's themselves. So we could ask them, you know, what would, when, when would a reliable treatment be available in the mixed one, in the negative one, the positive one, and any feedback and comments. So let me escape here and show you what one of those uh, look like, if I can get this to work okay. Are you seeing the uh, Red Cross on there? Yes, yeah. that's good, Jerry. Yay, okay. So this is what a real-time Delphi looks like. I'll, I'll, I'll come back up to it, but just to show you very quickly, that's what it looks like on a, on a scan quickly. So you give the people the instructions, and usually we start off with a basic question, and then you have sub-questions. But you'll notice when people answer it, they also discuss it down here so that you can see what other people have said and come back later on and maybe edit what you've said and say, hey, I've been misunderstood. I meant this, not that. So it's a way of having a structured conversation with completely different people, anonymous, where ideas are persuasive rather than personalities or rank. And then always, always ask people, what are the secondary, primary, secondary, and tertiary consequences of whatever the variable is over here. One of the areas that I want to sh show you with really, a, we're way off on, is how many people will die from COVID-19 in the United States by the date shown. So we ask for the highest by a certain date, the lowest by a certain date, and then a year later, highest and lowest. And the, the, the conversation really should turn around 200 to 300, so for very few people got up to over to 600. That was one of the one of the surprises to us. So anyway, um, also you'll notice that when, I don't know if you can quite see this, but the answers where they had comments, if somebody said very likely, why did they say that? If it was a 50-50 chance, why did they say that? So you can organize the comments also by their initial answer, their, their numeric answers as well. It's a very, very good system. If you haven't used it, you should try it out sometime. So, let me stop sharing. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry. Um, yeah. yeah, so the system itself, is that commercially available? Was that a yeah. homegrown piece of oh, software? Oh, it's all Tell over the place. Yeah, about yeah. Well, well Ted, Ted invented it. But wow. he was involved in the first one, the Red Corporation. But then he invented the next version, uh, the real-time Delphi. And uh, there are now, the, the Finland has a virgin, uh, version. Uh, Poland has a version. I think there's another one in, in Germany. And the Millennium Project has got two. We've got one on our global futures intelligence system, and then, then one in the original system that Ted has directly. So yeah, it is allowed. So if somebody possible. if somebody wanted to use that tool, where would where would they go? Well, they can drop Ted or myself a line and take it from okay. there. Great. Okay, thanks. Okay. Now let's see. You can see this uh, slide here, factors of change. No. No? Okay. Why not? Let's see, We've got shared screen. Oh, it's not shared screen yet. Let's see if we can come back over to here. Shared screen. Okay. Uh, yes. Now we're back. Yes. 
Good, I'm glad you can see it, but I, there we go. Now, and it will come up to here, and I'm so I can see it too. All right. Now, one of the things that we uh, did here is we took the baseline scenario, the America, America endures scenario, and says, okay, what would make it go from the baseline to a more pessimistic scenario? Well, one, opening too fast which of course occurred, and which is maybe occurring again in a lot of different countries. Immunity is not reliable. It fades and the virus mutates, which of course is in the case in many places. The number of infections in Africa, Latin America, and South Asia increase massively. And in my view, we haven't seen the worst of it yet, especially in Africa. And as you know, the number of people the virus goes through and the diversity of it, increases the likelihood of, of, of mutations. And so those are three sources still yet to go. Trust breaks down. To some degree, that's part of the anti fact stuff. Economic stimulus packages are too small and not long enough. So far, they've been pretty big, actually. So we're pretty good on that one. Factors that can move the US scenario baseline one, a little more optimistic. Well, one was implementation of a whole of nation COVID strategy, which did occur with the election of uh, the next administration. Reliable, fast at home tests and vaccines became available. Good contact tracing and, and quarantines are observed. Immunity is reliable and virus mutations are insignificant. FDA approved treatments are more effective and are mass produced. Uh, FDA approved vaccines and treatments both. Now that's another one too, is, is that we went over way over 65% efficacy. We got up to like over 90%. That was one of the other big surprises we had. Uh, some impacts uh, in the process, as I mentioned, one of the ideas of doing a scenario, original idea from Herman Kahn, wasn't, wasn't so much to describe a future state. It was more to find out what you didn't know along the way. So as you write the scenario, you get to a point and you say, ah, I don't know, or that's not possible. So as I was writing the scenario, I had to find out how many contact tracers were available in the United States. Turned out there was not enough. So the concept of co contact tracing as being a major factor didn't look like, like it was gonna work. So I figured, okay, stop writing. <laughs> Either we throw it out or we have to explain how it's plausible. So, you know, will, will the military be involved? Yes. Will National Guards be involved? Yes. And we even brought in the Peace Corps. Well, we didn't bring in the other ones, but the Peace Corps we did bring in. I'm on the, uh, the Peace Corps of future, future the Peace Corps committee, so I knew a bunch of the players. So I said, with the return, about 7,000 volunteers who were overseas when the pandemic started were brought back to the United States. So they're twiddling their thumbs. I said, well, why not put all these people to work and other return volunteers as well? And I'm very pleased to say that that happened. Uh, along the way, and the Dr. Fauci even did a video video this on this link here, um, can, thanking the Peace Corps for their their valuable role in contact tracing in the United States. And that was one of the results of our work. It got translated into Chinese, Korean, Israeli, Hebrew, per, uh, and Spanish, and, and circulated in Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, we discussed the scenarios on PBS, uh, on some podcasts like this, in conferences and distributed by the London Project node chairs in different countries. Uh, Fauci's office, as I mentioned, circulated the actual final scenarios and, and the whole full report for that matter uh, to the NIH mailing list. G7, not that we had anything to do with the G7, but the G7 statement on, on decentralization of manufacturing was almost a verbatim, uh, uh, same, same words and choices of what we're talking about. This is a current critical issue as we speak, because if we have future pandemics and we haven't got decentralized production buying licenses on patents and so forth then we're going to have the same bottlenecks we're going through right now and, and hopefully that's going to be one of the learnings that gets passed on key lessons learned scanning far more than usual since it was world real time worldwide uh yeah, Jerry, this, this is a good point for a question. Um, Bill had a question. Could you yeah. elaborate a little bit more on, on what you mean? Is it really real time? Because we've heard moving Delphi and real time Delphi. Yeah. How about your, give sure. us your thoughts. On what, what do you yeah, mean by real? real? Yeah, because let's, let's say that I'm online filling out the questionnaire. And I haven't answered num question number three. And you're online at the same time. 
you get to question number three and you see my answer is not there yet. But, the, but while you're there, if I'm typing and I hit the return key, once I hit the return key, you get it. So it's real time in that sense. As long as I'm hitting the return key, you're getting it. And real time was introduced as a term to contrast this with the original Delphi, which used mailed or faxed uh, questionnaires and took months and months to complete as a result. Still useful, still yes. done, augmented yep. by uh, online systems. Yep. But real-time Delphi gave the feedback in real time, as Jerry just explained. Right. So, so it's, yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. The, the, the old Delphi, that where the answers create round two, round two answers create round three, is in my judgment still superior. But if you're in a hurry, like we were, the real-time Delphi is the only possible choice you can make. Right. I mean, five in a couple of months, is, you couldn't do conventional ones like you couldn't even do one in, in a couple of months. Okay, um, the uh, detailed scenarios connected present and short-term futures with cause and effect links and decisions exposing what we did not know. And that was an example of contact tracing was, was, was one of those. The difference between the best and worst scenarios was re and for such a short period of time was really wide. And at the time that we were writing them over a year ago, the difference wasn't so much vaccines because they weren't available at the time. Uh, and the treatment was not you know, all that available either. The human agency, the responsibility of the human was the difference between the, the, the two extremes. If we really got serious about locking down, really got serious about uh, uh, washing our hands and, and covering our um, face with masks, if that agent, that agency was really the variable between the good and the bad scenario, because we weren't getting any good leadership at the time, you may remember. Most likely, is that the worst is yet to come, which we wrote then, which was the case, because if you go back, the really rough stuff was after September, October. 40% non-symptomatic transmission. That's a real problem because you couldn't know who was transferring what. You didn't even know if you were transferring it. Um, therefore, we have to live with this for some years as best we can tell. Um, and. Uh, Let's see, what are the quick things here? Yeah, one of the surprises, as I mentioned, the vaccine efficacy over 90%. When we began, uh, the guy from John Hopkins said, look, if we get over 55%, consider it lucky. None of us, and I don't remember anybody talking about 90%. The deaths were higher though than we thought. The vaccine campaign was extremely effective. Uh, very fast, as you remember. Uh, and the economic recovery so far has been a little better than I think that we, we expected. So with that, Ted, uh, why don't you take it on? Well, before uh, we go on, I, I want to do a mild, quick introduction to Ted Gordon. Not only was he part of the early RAND Corporation's um, consultancy team on, on the Delphi, but he was also the manager of the third stage of the Apollo rockets. So I like to say, uh, when someone says it doesn't take rocket science, I say, yes, it does. And there he is. Ted? Jerry, yours. thank you. Welcome. Um, I drew the short stroke, the short straw uh, <laughs> for the scenarios. I had the negative scenario. And aside from some personal catastrophes, this really threw me uh, into, a, into a funk. I was depressed because every place I looked, I was looking for the worst. And it was there to be found. Uh, the curve that's on the background of this introductory slide is the number of deaths in the U.S. And you see it topping out at 600,000. Actually, it's about six, 620 now. Uh, and that is damn bad. And that's not the projection, the full projection, because depending on how the um, uh, variations go, this curve may yet go higher. Uh, if we look at it, Jerry, you're going to do the flipping of the slides, please. Yeah, you're all set. Yeah, yeah. go for, to the next one. <clears throat> well, here's what we learn in putting the bad scenario together. We're not just talking about a single problem, but we're talking about intertwined problems. The, one of the biggest helps we got was from economists working with us who explained to us uh, with great detail why it was necessary to spend trillions of dollars uh, to avoid a, uh, a, uh, an economic meltdown, a real meltdown, uh, comparable to the 1930s, 
uh, and uh, even worse. So we were facing um, a problem of economics, of the socio social consequences that would come with such a uh, downturn, in addition to the medical problems. And they were all intertwined. We couldn't solve the medical problems without considering the political impacts or the economic impacts. Uh, so Jerry drew this as a series of overlapping Venn diagrams, but uh, facts and, and uh, uh, conjectures in all of these fields influenced one another. So as we put this together, each of the peoples that had specialties in these areas had their say. And on the negative side, the say was bleak. We had no history to start with. One of the great techniques of futures is extrapolation. Well, if you have no history, extrapolation doesn't work. There's no place to start. How can we extrapolate deaths when there are no deaths, when death, no deaths have occurred? Uh, there, we had data on new cases and deaths were available, but probably undercounted. Uh, this morning, just this morning, continuing with the um, interchange of information that Jerry mentioned before, I saw an article come across on uh, prevalence uh, and uh, cases not counted. And the article made the point that in the United States, 60% of the cases were likely uncounted today, as we exist today. Well, that's a hell of a base to build quantitative forecasts on. Uh, and, and yet what we had was useful. We wanted to build a trend impact analysis, which is the next step after a different kind of model where we took historical data and asked about future events and their impact on extrapolations. We gave it a good shot, but there was not enough history to build any confidence at all that that technique would work. The state of the pandemic index that Jerry mentioned was championed by one of the economists. It was built on the basis of our uh, state of the futures index, which the Millennium Project has produced now for what, a decade and a half? Something like that, maybe two decades. Uh, Over 25 years now. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, since 1990. Okay. So it was 19, no, 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 so 2000, no, yeah, 20 years, you're right, 20 years. Okay. But, but we couldn't build the pandemic index because we didn't have enough data. It was data poor. The index, of course, is a way to put together variable, different variables uh, made from the same set of assumptions, hopefully, uh, and to project each of the variables given the future developments that would impact on their course. Uh, it works uh, in the, in the, state, of the state of the future as an index where the variables are well known and there's a good solid history behind them. Uh, but without that history, uh, we felt that the pandemic index was ahead of its time and it still remains as something to be done. Surprisingly, this notion of meeting weekly worked like a charm. It really educated us, uh, introduced us to the other people whose ideas we would have to share and build on uh, and uh, curating of the articles. It was an enormously uh, productive area. I, I, I think Paul's going to talk a little bit more about that since we were using a system that he made available to us to do that, to, to do those meetings. Meetings were Zoom meetings, Zoom meetings. Uh, the discussion was uh, helped very, very helpful. Um, and I, at the end, uh, as I was putting together this presentation, I re recognize that we didn't have one piece of data which would have been really useful, and that's the number of recoveries. When the number of recoveries exceed new cases, we had data on new, new infections, then, then the pandemic's over. What is, what is better than that? More people are recovering than are becoming sick. Then we know we're on the right course, and uh, the, that data is now available to us. Go show, go. go Next slide, Jura. Um, we were surprised about, uh, we should have said more about, we think, in our, in our write-up, that the speed of vaccine development from multiple sources wasn't just one vaccine, it was a whole slew of them, uh, and all done fast and all done effectively, all, all effective. Uh, we did not understand the strength of the anti-vax or the anti-mask sentiment. 
we did not understand that this was a political issue that would separate Democrats from Republicans in our country, uh, that you could recognize a Democrat because they wore a mask and Republicans did not. Now, here's this little graph over here shows the percentage of the U.S. population uh, who say that the virus is a major threat to the U.S. And you see the difference between Republicans and Democrats. We said it's a political issue. Well, yeah, okay, politics, politics. But this is a div divisive issue. This separates people by their political beliefs and reflects in their medical capabilities in their in their in their health. Um, un, it was not it did not make it into our into our scenario. Although Paul will have something to say about that at at a higher higher level, but we should have and did not recognize. Uh, that this separation was real, important, lasting, and uh, uh, divided the country, divides the country. Uh, it, the country's divided in another dimension as well. Who would have guessed that in the United States, with our respect for planning, that there would be competition between cities, between hospitals, between for ventilators, for vaccines? Every, every city decides its own policies. What kind of system is that? Uh, we did not show how, we did not, didn't think about that. Who would have guessed that? Uh, the consequences of committing trillions of dollars to avoid economic catastrophe, the absolute necessity to do it, and the strength to do it is something that we did include, and it was a result of the uh, arguments of the ec economists on our team who made us, even in the worst scenario, say that uh, this was necessary and would probably happen. What we didn't talk about was the consequences of spending so much money uh, on uh, uh, avoiding the worst of the uh, catastrophes. The lockdown consequences we omitted, the PTSD, the kids at home, the isolation, the work redesign, the Zoom, uh, the, both from a positive and negative standpoint. Uh, not, I don't think we went deep enough into it deeply enough into it. Uh, the effects of an uneven reentry, we're still in the midst of that. There are no standard criteria for open up, opening up schools. Can you imagine uh, for opening up retail, for opening up transport, sports, every, every venue is on its own and makes its own rules and relies on CDC in ways that it interprets themselves. Uh, for uh, what to do. Next slide, please. And we're left with some questions. If we were to do this again, how would we begin? How would we pick up with the tail of the bad scenario and uh, to write the next one? <clears throat> we don't know if vaccines will work as the virus mutates and adapts. Uh, it's true. There was even a hint in something that we read that the virus act was acting as intelligent. It, it, it's beyond <clears throat> beyond uh, reason to think that the virus is intelligent, but it appears that the virus is mutating in directions which give us the most trouble and build on information that it might have been collecting in the past infections. Now, that's really science fiction stuff, but how does the virus mutate? How, what directions does it take and how do we anticipate its directions? Will quantitative models work when the virus mutates? We've built up a year and a half, two years worth of data now, and some of the models um, are extremely useful. That slide I showed you at the beginning, showing 600,000 deaths in the US is a result of one of the models. Uh, does it work for the mutated virus? Uh, and anti-vax anti attitudes, will they, will they continue? What's it going to take to change them? The news in the United States is full of mandate discussions. Uh, the federal government is mandating, requiring that employees of the federal government become vaccinated. And everybody is saying there's going to be a backlash from that because people don't like to be told what to do. But in this case, they must. Significant side effects yet to be discovered. Yes, downstream, there are going to be more side effects discovered. We don't know them all. We don't know many, any, many 
many, let's say, um, and uh, they could be important to the evolution of our strategies. Can the carriers who are asymptotic, asymptomatic, be cost effectively identified, as Jerry said, doing that would help us a great deal in understanding how the disease spreads. Will the immune persons, assuming we could identify them, emerge as a new privileged societal faction, the idea of a vaccine passport or something akin to it? We need international scenarios. Our scenarios focused only on the US because the client in our case was the US Red Cross. Uh, but it's clear that you're not gonna solve this problem if it's only solved in one nation because uh, unless we restrict completely all travel, international travel, what exists in one country gets to another. And how much inflation? We foresaw that inflation would come from the spending that was required, but how bad does it get? We haven't seen the, the last of that yet. Next question, or next slide, Jerry. And there's a lot of stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor. It didn't make it into the scenario. And in thinking about the, the next time around, if there is one, these are things that we ought to dust off again. Don't lose the ideas if you try to do this as yourselves, because some of these will be uh, reborn in new forms. Positive identification of the pan pandemic origin. We didn't touch that, or we kept it as an unknown in this second uh, scenario. But knowing where it came from will make a difference about what we write about the future, particularly if we find that the uh, escaped virus, number one, uh, had an origin of a um, military, with a military uh, implication. Uh, so uh, positive identification remains an unknown and important to the future of scenarios if we write them. A one cent, one second diagnostic to find out who's a carrier. The discovery of large scale side effects, synergistic cures and appalling consequences. Synergistic cures, there's a positive one. Uh, maybe we're curing the common cold as we find cures for COVID. And but by the way, Ted, there's just an article a couple of days ago that said that it looks like influenza may be close to disappearing as a result. There you go, there you go. We'll, we'll see if that happens. And appalling consequences. I hate to think about what they might be if, if it takes time for them to develop and show their heads. Uh, an idea which is interesting, it will be certainly unpopular, uh, mass distribution of a passive virus killer like fluoride in the water supply attacks dental cavities and it, uh, it applies to everybody. You don't have a choice. It's there in the water. You drink water and your cavities are taken care of. Um, a public health solution. Could there be one like that for COVID? And the question there then would go away. Uh, I'm not um, I'm anti-vax. Well, you, if you want to drink some water, if you want water, you got to drink the virus killer. Uh, as I say, that, that would be a, a great uh, debate, a greatly debated point. International competition or cooperation, uh, the, vi the mutations keep ahead of the vaccines. Can we, really, can we really continue to do a catch up job? Not just unemployment, but jobless people. One of the cures that's been applied to avoid a, a depression has been to give people essentially a, uh, an income, uh, even if they don't work. That's where a lot of that money went, is going. Uh, and uh, they, there's a sentiment growing in, in our country that people who are getting paid for not working, even though they're not working, become permanently, more permanently affixed to that lifestyle. So they become jobless people and the, and the, and the, and the economy uh, suffers because of it. There's a growing distrust in all forms of data and science. Uh, the gaps, name your gap, grow, wealth, racial, gender. Hospitals collapse. I don't think uh, they were close to collapsing. They, right. Then they're going in that direction again. But I don't know if any really did just go out of business. Some rural uh, hospitals did, in fact, because of the cutback. They couldn't handle it in the United States. Some rural hospitals did. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hopes for a single effective vaccine have been abandoned, or uh, we wrote that it might be possible to include that in a negative scenario. And also, we had items that we removed uh, reflecting corruption in certain instances. Who's getting the vaccine? Who's not getting the vaccine? It's not always on the basis of need. Uh, and uh, martial law, uh, given the leadership we had at the time, we saw as a possibility. Next slide. Just in closing, I want to mention that we had not only the three scenarios, which were cause and effect scenarios, as Jerry mentioned, but cross-cutting flash scenarios um, that were uh, instant, small, one-page descriptions of something that happened and cut across all other uh, suspended beliefs uh, to provide uh, important uh, contrast or important generators of change to the discussion. Yeah, there are two that are with the material you've received. One is called a COVID surprise, not cause and effect, uh, but it describes a situation in which uh, COVID is concentrated in certain age groups, which it is. And the proprietors of certain venues, like restaurants, theaters, and so on, exclude people who are likely to be in the age group that is most uh, affected. So this, this situation results in age discrimination. Uh, you can come in if you're young, but you can't come in if you're old. It's a terrible situation, but, but plausible. And uh, now you can see the other side of the game by uh, in Paul Sappho's uh, address. He's going to be tell telling you about the positive scenarios so you can end with a smile. Jerry? Okay, we have one, one quick question from the audience uh, for Ted. Um, did you, in your scenario development of your scenario, did you come up with a final projection, worst case numbers of deaths or a range of deaths or maximum number of deaths? Yes. Yeah. And what was that? Uh, I'd have to go back and look at it. Let me, let me say first, the accuracy of the scenarios and the quantitative nature of projections of the sort you're asking for is not, is not the, the way to, to judge the scenarios. They, they are there, the, the appropriate question, I think, is are they useful to planning? Not necessarily are they accurate, but nevertheless, the, the scenarios do have to be quantitative, uh, these in particular. What, what number did we quote, Jerry? Well, I think in the, in the, the baseline scenario, I think it was 500 or 600,000. Uh, uh, and it was similar to that in the positive of Paul's. Yours may have been a higher number. Uh, I yeah, it was. I think it was 700,000. I'd have to go back and look. Okay, okay Paul. Yep. Great. Yes. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is um, focus, focus on just one aspect. I... Uh, I'll say something about scenario three in a moment, but it was a methodological lesson, not exactly learned, but uh, I always uh, am reminded of it. And uh, it's, I, it's, it is, of course, uh, my term for it is Cassandra's conundrum. Uh, the question is, do you tell it straight and risk being ignored, or do you put a spin on your forecast in hopes that somebody will take advantage of it? Because, of course, the whole point of forecasting is to help people make better decisions in the present. And, and I think Cassandra is something of a patron saint for all of us futurists. I always remember uh, the contemporaneous description of Cassandra was beautiful, clever, but insane. And, um, and I like to think I'm at least the first two of those. Um, <laughs> I, I put this slide up uh, stating three obvious points here, but during the whole process, Number one, that scenarios about our possibilities, not predictions, uh, I, it happened to me again and again, and I think all of us that we got attached to our scenarios and, and we kept trying to say, we're trying, you know, thinking, I'm gonna be, I wanna be right. I wanna predict the outcome. And of course, the most important thing for a forecaster is to uh, keep that sense of detachment. Uh, and by the way, I'm gonna show this at the very end uh, after we do the slides, there's a picture of a young Ted Gordon, and there's a story behind the book. Uh, Jerry, give me the uh, next slide, please. 
So just a methodological background. One of the really useful tools for us was using an old fashioned listserv. If you all don't use Groups.io already, it's basically the successor to Yahoo Groups done right. And this was the, this was the uh, group chat we use. It's, it's called ME297 Foresight because in fact, uh, that's the number of my class I teach at Stanford in winter quarter. And um, it turned out it was another, we, we found that just pouring everything into a single information waterhole that it actually included Stanford students was a really helpful way to do high-speed horizon scanning and have discussions. And so I'm a big believer in old technology. I, of course, I'm an early adopter, but part of why this whole thing came about was I keep a journal. And this was my journal entry in late December. A friend of mine in China said, hey, something's brewing. And I always have a, I'd like to say I had incredible foresight that I thought the pandemic was gonna be an issue in late December every year, I'm always thinking of a new example of how to explain exponentials to engineering students at Stanford. Because even though they're wicked smart and they do the math, they all forgot their exponentials right after taking SATs. That's how I got on it. Look for indicators. Next slide. So uh, I, miss, I was late to a call and I got assigned the optimistic scenario because Ted and Jerry had already grabbed the other two scenarios. And by early May, this was the depths of, of the pandemic and, and the sense of depression was palpable. And I thought, how do we ever do a positive scenario here? And um, I actually in the early days referred to it as the rainbows and unicorns scenario, uh, reminding my colleagues that they owed me for making me do the positive one. And the big challenge in the scenario Scenarios have to be plausible and internally consistent. The political divide was ob obvious already. And the challenge was, what is something that would be so dramatic that would cause a change of mind and a change of attitude among the growing population of de deniers? And so I wrote up the obvious possibility that President Trump got COVID-19, was in an induced coma, family hospitalized and the whole thing. So that was, um, that was why I came up with this. Next slide, please, Jerry. This is where the, the Cassandra part comes in. The consensus among the group is, if you write that about President Trump being in a coma, nobody's gonna read the report and we're gonna have no impact. And so then the question was, well, how to come up with another option. And, and I think we all face this that as forecasters, finding the balance between the intuition of being alone with the group mind, how do you make the best of the group mind without uh, being overly influenced? Or uh, I just finished a joint paper with someone else and that challenge of how do you keep it lively and like. So we dumped the president and softened it a bit um, and, and we, we gave the comas to White House staff rather than, or cabinet members rather than the president. And I leave it to you to think which White House cabinet member you most wanted to be in a coma. Um, but we went through one more revision to the final one. Jerry, next slide. And here's how it ended up. We not only dropped the president, we dropped uh, the White House and we said, oh, okay, then it's going to be uh, the number of deaths will shock people. So now it's the woulda, coulda, shoulda question is, you know, uh, for a while there, uh, and I kept notes of my own, I see, darn it, I was right. The president's coma thing was right. And I got beaten off what I should have done. But that was wrong as well because it turns out even the president catching COVID was not enough to change public thinking. And in fact, even though I think scenario three is the closest to what actually happened, uh, we never came up with a plausible reason for how we ended up there because the contributing factor was, was in fact the, the vaccine. Well, so also uh, the contrib if I may, the also a contributing factor uh, was the, the election of, of, uh, of the next president. Because 
you couldn't have a national plan. All that chewing and everything was going on. The national plan came after because we, we published these things before the election. We finished these things before the election. And we wanted to because we're, we want to influence both camps a, a bit. Yeah. But yeah. So the election was a very big factor, but it's hard because how do you call that in the middle of a <laughs> writing it? Because right. we would like to have the right wing read it as well as the left wing. Right. And, you know, of course, that is the, the lesson of Cassandra. She was right, but never believed. In my case, I think I was wrong at every step of the road and, and still never quite believed. But it was a, a, a reminder that particularly when it comes to scenarios in particular, but forecasting in general, um, we are in a humble profession where um, our job is to come up with successive approximations of being wrong in order to get to something useful. Um, and if you put up the last slide, Jerry. So I, again, I've gone around and around on, did we do it right? Did we do it wrong? Did we stand by our guns? Did we change something? Um, and I would just say that I think that's in the nature of foresight and a really important methodological step is to be explicit about what, uh, you know, what you're doing, reminding ourselves, even us as professional forecasters, we're just writing a forecast, we're not making a prediction. And, and as a forecaster, I'm always pushing the edge of what uh, my clients or audience will listen to. Um, like on January 10th with my students at Stanford, when I introduce the subject of the pandemic as an exponential exercise. I said to them, what are the chances we're not gonna make it to the end of the quarter before they uh, shut down the campus? I had no insight. Um, I was just a guest. They looked at me like I was a crazy person. Uh, like I said, you know, um, clever, beautiful, and insane. And I said, no, no, this is just, is that in the realm of possibility? So this is one way to do it, to cover yourself. Um, this is uh, the, the note that Herman Kahn once wrote in the front of one of his reports, where he said, warnings, portions of this report are intentionally misleading in order to provoke thought. Slip that into your report and someone, if someone complains it, I'm just provoking thought. By the way, if I, I may add something about misleading to provoke thought. Um, Ted may remember this from Rand days with Herman. But one of the scenarios was what happens if there's no war between the Soviet Union? And, you know, the original mission was how do you prevent World War III? That's everything else was sort of entertainment. Well, what happens if there's no war for 20, 30 years or whatever? And you've got a completely different set of characters in, in the Kremlin, a completely different set of world actors going on, all kinds of different assumptions, different weapons. I mean, you just, you got to, how do you deal with the unknown unknown? So in one of the, so they had to stop writing, you know, and, and do your research. And one of the insights was how, the questions was, how do you convince your opponent that you're crazy enough to press the button? Because if you're not crazy enough to press the button, then the paper tiger and just bring those old <laughs> ships right in. And so Herman uh, determined that the way to convince the unknown leader or leaders that you're crazy is you'd have to build fallout shelters. So when people said, well, you know, you can't keep people underground all that time. That's right. That wasn't the point. It was to mislead Moscow to think we're so insane. How? By allowing a call to go out that people go to the fallout shelters, which would have television coverage of massive traffic jams in New York and Miami, St. Louis, San Francisco, Chicago, and what would you think in Moscow? You think these Americans are crazy. Look at the screen. The whole country's going to fall out shelters. They're ready to press the goddamn button. Stop the ships. Now, there was an example of misleading to provoke a thought that was important. So I'm, I'm, I'm done with my part. So, okay. Uh, so one of the key... Uh, long-term implications of this might be something that we just touched at the end of the America Endura scenario. And that is after some great event, uh, some things grow out of it. Massive forest fires, as Paul knows, out in California, you get regrowth eventually. New things happen, new plants happen. After World War II, we had the United Nations and we had uh, 
new forms of multilateral cooperation that didn't exist before at all. Uh, so what will come out of this? Now, World War II involved a lot of the world, but not all of it. But this thing is evolving the whole world simultaneously, where a lot of people are at home thinking, thinking more than they've had more time to think. So what will evolve out of this first time out? You know, it, it, all parents know when the, the, the children be, misbehave, you say time out, stop, sit down, think about what you did wrong. Well, we've done, we're in the process of doing this as a species for the first time. What will grow out of this remains to be seen. Stay tuned. Just a couple of words about the Millennium Project that don't know it. We've got 68 uh, nodes around the world that connect local thinking with the global. So when we send out a note on the, on the uh, international Delphi, you know, pick some medical people and some health people to respond to it. Then we take all this and give it back to everybody so they can have translations or whatever. So when people talk about global local, this is our management answer to that with these nodes. Uh, I'm not expecting anybody to read all this, but just to let you know, we've done an awful lot of stuff. And, and the US COVID scenarios was the 56th uh, international study that we've done. We've also got something that all futurists should have if they don't, uh, and that's the futures of methodology. This is the largest collection of methods around. Scenarios is just one chapter. And this, is, this is some good stuff. And if I can get some other stuff done, uh, then we'll do a version 4.0, maybe about a year or so. And then you can get all of these sort of stuff online. Thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, and I think Paul's last slides uh, said it all. It was very, very thought provoking. Um, wonderful. Um, before we get in, before we open up the floor for questions, uh, I'd like to ask uh, our TechCast founder and creator of this forum, uh, Professor Emeritus at George Washington University, Bill Halal, uh, to give us some thoughts. What, do you, what are your thoughts from your perspective, Bill, on what we've just heard? Well, I fully agree with you, Art. This was so stimulating intellectually. Uh, it was a, a feast of future studies, as uh, I think you could call it. I was impressed with the... Uh, the rigorous method that was used, it seemed uh, uh, you took, took all the uh, uncertainties into account and the uh, scope of it, so many different people involved and the policy impacts are just everywhere. You see them throughout the whole thing. It's just a model of good strategic foresight. And we, we thank the three of you so much. It's just wonderful work. Thank you so much. Uh, I have one question that all this raises in my mind and I told you this before, uh, we know that I think we're going to see more pandemics because the conditions that caused them are still here, which is mainly jet travel and the fact that we're encroaching on the habitat of all these, these animals. So we're going to see more uh, threats like this. And so the, the thing that all this poses in my mind is what can we learn from this that would allow us to head off future pandemics more effectively? And I think two main uh, aspects of that are probably uh, prompted. One is detecting an outbreak really quickly. And I wonder if, if AI could be useful in that regard. Could, could you imagine, I asked the three of you, could you imagine a sophisticated system in a few years that operates like the, uh, the immune system of the body, that it's intelligent and it detects threats. It picks up threats around the world and alerts uh, the right people. It seems to me that might be a good application of AI. And then the other thing that is needed is to the response. How do you get the world to respond quickly enough to dampen that threat? Those, those are the things that come to my mind. I, I asked uh, Jerry and Ted and Paul if they have any thoughts about that. Well, I well, think that, I'm that, sorry. Uh, yeah, I that, think AI could have that application for sure. Uh, but once the alarm bell goes off, then is the world ready to take action? That's the unsolved part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, I throw in a couple of things here. There is this, I, I'm not necessarily a big fan of Mr. Johnson in London, but I, I was shocked at how good his speech was at the UN, uh, I guess, last September or so. And he had a five point program for the future of pandemics. And I would strongly recommend anybody that wants to look at this question to see that. One of the things that he had in that five point program 
was to create a data bank uh, all of the viruses and all of the things you had to know to, 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 you, to you just start this. So if a virus comes up, it's slightly similar, you know, you got a leg up on the conversation. So it would be a massive worldwide effort to, to, to tell them that's, that's one. Second one uh, is decentralization. It drives me nuts when I hear people saying Japan didn't do much. And I agree. They could have bought a license on the patent of any of those vaccines and produce, they're, they're, they're top engineers in the world, you know, construction people, they can make those, those vaccines. So I think that we should create a franchising system of some sort or a license, buying licenses on patents uh, and, and having quality control of production worldwide, all over the place. Say, and also with masks and with protective equipment, the whole, the whole business so that you're ready to go and when you consider how much, this is a, hold this one to your mind at this point. Think of how much money we spend. It's about $2 trillion a year now on annual budgets, all the military put together. It's about $2 trillion. Now, um, to prevent wars that we hope or fight if, if they happen, right? Well, we know for sure we're more likely to get a pandemic in the future than we are with the war, with the ma main war because the main wars just haven't happened. Um, so I would say that uh, we should think in terms of, uh, I think we had it in, in, in the report, that somebody did a study showing how much money if spent would have headed this off. Um, and it was a fraction of what we ended up spending, of course. But I think futurists ought to bring up this conversation worldwide we know a pandemic, we know, we're more certain that a pandemic will happen in 10 or more years than we are that a world war will happen in 10 to 20 years. But look how much money we put in to the military thing and what, and what we don't put into the health thing. And um, so those were a couple of thoughts I'd have on, on round two of this. Yeah, and uh, I, I wanna hear from the group. Uh, I will just say regarding AI, having lived several decades professional life in Silicon Valley, that if we're counting on AI, it is, you know, someday when I die, I want to make sure I die in Silicon Valley because everything here arrives late. And <laughs> AI is one of the latest. I mean, the net effect of 40 years of AI is that uh, my definition of AI is what you call machine learning and a business plan. So uh, let's hope we're not dependent on AI. But uh, Bill, let's hear from the group. What are their thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think they got to unmute themselves. Questions. Yeah, you can feel free to, to either type your comment or question in the chat box or just uh, hit your unmute button and speak up. Yeah, well, I'm going to call up somebody. John Friedman. Where's John? There he is. John, you're a, you're a person who knows a lot about this kind of thing. In fact, John, you're a medical physician. Why don't you give us your thoughts? You're muted, John. Yeah. Everyone can unmute themselves now if they wish. Sure. And note that I put a raised hand logo in my screen. That's a great way if you have a question is click oh. on raise hand at the bottom. Well, while John is thinking about that, let me call on John Lewis. John, John Lewis, could you uh, unmute yourself and give us your thoughts about this? I know you're the kind of person who uh, is good at uh, this kind of thing. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yes, John. Um, th thank you, Bill. Uh, fabulous uh, presentation, by the way. Um, and does it Jerome or Jerry? Uh, well, it's, it's Jerome if you Google, because if you Jerry Glenn, you won't get anything. But the person is Jerry, and the Google search is Jerome. Okay, I think I got that. Jerry? Uh, I, so I, I really like um, your comment at the end because all of this is um still evolving it's complex we're projecting what could happen um about the pandemic but your your point was what is the fallout what will grow out of people having a year to stop and think uh i'm paraphrasing i'm paraphrasing um and i think that's um uh that's kind of where my mind has been uh thinking about uh where global consciousness and that that sort of topic goes 
Um, so that's, um, I, I think, really a great way to, um, to, to think about the positive side of this, because I think that um, we collectively are reactive. And uh, that question is, is pro- a really good provoking one um, that has implications beyond uh, future pandemics. Yeah, good point. Uh, I, I can think of two or three uh, positive outcomes already. Uh, number one, everybody's been forced online, so we're learning how to live <laughs> online. Number two, there's been a uh, uh, recognition that the, the system doesn't work, that is the global system doesn't work, and we have to change the, the mindset. And I'm wondering, I wonder if what Jerry and, uh, and Ted and Paul think, I wonder if this might provoke uh, some uh, global cooperation now that the need is so obvious. Do you think that's possible? Well, no way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Paul, you know, (laughs) yes, it's going to poke. It already has. We've already have. Did anybody pay attention to the G7 meeting? There was coordination on money, on vaccines, on priorities, the G7. And now we got the G20 coming up which was very effective on the financial deal in the back 2008 or so, then that'll extend the whole thing as well. No, th- this is, I, I, th- I think that out of this will come more serious global collaboration than before. Trump is an anomaly. He's no. not a trend. No. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Jerry, Annette just asked a really great question. Uh, in the chat said, reading about the 1918 pandemic is insightful and possibly predictive. For example, anti-masking was a significant problem then too. How was reflecting on past pandemics informative to the scenario process? Yeah, well, it it did for me. Well, you remember I put in the, 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 I think the second page of the report, a photograph of two or three people uh, from the Spanish flu with a sign around them saying, wear a mask or go to jail. And that was pretty, <laughs> pretty blunt. The second is to look at the waves of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the Spanish flu. The second wave was much bigger impact than the first wave, just exactly like ours. Yeah. Also, and this is a little bit of nasty stuff. Also, what happened after the Spanish flu? You had this pent up demand and the roaring 20s occurred. And then what happened with after the roaring 20s? The depression. Yeah. So let's not do that again. <laughs> well, I'd add to that, you know, I think as for all of us forecasters, being wise after the fact is just hard to avoid. And your comment, Annette, is really provocative because now reading, you know, we now have a whole bunch of books that have gone way deeper on the 1918 pandemic and cartoons and things that showed what really wasn't in the literature two years ago that people back then were just as crazy about anti-masking and everything else as they are today. And if only I could have read that two years ago, I think it would have made a clearer path and understanding that amidst all the change, the constant is human stupidity. Yeah, I want to call on Victor Maki. Victor is a, a, a executive in the World of Future Studies Federation. I'm sure he has some thoughts. Victor, what do you think? Thank you very much, Bill, for the introduction. And also thank you a lot to the presenters today because I really enjoyed the methodological part as well as the content, which was exactly informative for many decision makers. But uh, I was wondering about a couple of points. One of them is related to this uh, uh, framing issue. I mean, when we say that uh, there are anti-vaccination sentiments. Why not thinking of this like anti, uh, um, uh, anti uh, thinking about uh, to uh, uh, resisting against the uh, intervention of government against individual freedoms so that perhaps these vaccinations mandates become a precedent for future uh, governments intervention in society And the second point is about the mutations. Well, in the positive sense, I didn't see any mention about a sort of mutation or a random uh, occurrence or event that uh, will uh, uh, cause the virus 
to become weakened as opposed to become more potent. Because uh, if you remember before uh, COVID-19, there was other similar uh, uh, coronavirus uh, diseases and some of them actually ended because there was uh, so mutations, such kind of mutations that actually uh, made them less potent, less, uh, less effective in uh, uh, spreading a society or less lethal. And these are my uh, two questions from the presenters today. Well, quick comment on, on the mutation part. Um, there's literally been hundreds of mutations, but they're so insignificant, they don't matter. Um, but we can look at a spread of mutations from positive to negative. Hmm? The ones we were worrying about was a negative. So in, in America indoors, we did have toward the end there, it says, and because of the stuff coming up from Africa and South Asia and Latin America, we now have to go to new research for new, uh, you know, new vaccines and so forth. So it, it was covered a little bit in there. Um, but I forgot the first party question again, say that. Uh, I was thinking about how best to frame the anti-vaccination sentiments because ah. uh, the, pr pr from the point of view of most Republicans, I would say that it could provide, I mean, the vaccination mandate could provide a precedent for further intervention of the yeah. government, of the state yeah, yeah. and personal yeah, yeah. rights or uh, freedoms. The conflict well, what, between, what, yeah. was it, yeah, what was it Churchill said that the Americans, after they've exhausted all the possibility, other possibilities, they finally stumbled into the right answer? Well, I, if you watch Fox News, they're now talking about get a vaccine. They've Jerry, changed. more than more they've changed. More than so that. Do what you, I'm saying, what I'm, the point I'm making is that you have this stupidity, but the stupidity that doesn't always last. And also a counterfactual. What happens if 80,000 votes were different over three states and, and Hillary was elected? The response to the vaccine and the whole business would be quite different over the last four, four, previous four years. Uh, on, on Victor's point, I heard yesterday that in New York, uh, people who are not vaccinated are, are being given a hundred dollars for a vaccination. Yeah. So and it's, so there's negative. Lotteries, yeah. And, and there's a little uptick this starting, but I, I saw Julio uh, wanted to say something. <coughs> un, un, unmute yourself there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for this invitation. Jerome, Ted, everybody, uh, Bill, uh, is a real wonderful opportunity to think about what happens in the future with this problem that we are facing today. My, my question is um, regarding uh, the scenarios is that we have not real international data. We have, uh, we have uh, one uh, problem in that regard. Uh, the reaction in every country is, now is quite different. You look in Europe that uh, France uh, reacted different for than the England or US, they have another approach about that situation. China is different in that regard. And we are looking now the problems that uh, the Japanese are facing into the Olympic games. This is a real, incredible. Uh, I think that in this scenario, one of the important thing is to try to connect the international information. What do you think about? Well, this is, well, the G7 began the conversation, World Health Representatives, I think it's in process right now. Uh, we'll see what the G20 does. Uh, but, all, but we've got to remember that the world, as you know, the World Health Organization is a club of nation states. And, and, and the club of nation states can be influenced by the G7 and the G20. Uh, and I think that, 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 that more of that will happen than less. I think that's the direction we'll be going. Like, stay tuned to the G20 meeting. Mm. Yeah. Okay, hey, we have a, a more practical question. Oh, oh by the way, I also did one last thing. Okay. And, and, uh, and Julio, what I was also on this, some evidence of this is imagine Johnson in the UK, his five point program. That's, he's really talking about what you're talking about, the whole business. I mean, if, if a conservative in the UK is pushing it, well, you know, that's that's pretty good deal. So we'll, the things are in motion. Uh, it, it depends on how they all short out, but I'm optimistic that we'll get more serious uh, over the next couple of years. 
and, and, co and cooperation as well. Yeah. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Yashar Saghai has a great question, and is, it is, how has the Red Cross used these scenarios? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, this was a big mystery. Because these, now, now, you know, it, it's easy for us to beat up on the Red Cross, but so, most of we... these people, and Sappho will do a better job, but I'll do, I'll do the introductory round. He can get the round, he can do the knockout. I think the nature What's of the you, question was if they instigated it, then how did they end up using it? <laughs> okay. Why don't I just cut the mind, yeah. Jerry? Can you All pause right, the ahead. recording for a second? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's too, the on, the National Security Agency's that? got it anyway. Okay. So re <laughs> recording's paused. No, uh, I don't know. Steve? Is no, it? don't worry about it. Okay. Well, um, so, yeah. I, uh, yeah. So this, like so many things, this came about because personal friendships. Uh, I was leading my class on a forecast exercise in early January. Then someone from the WHO called me about something completely different at the end of February, uh, January. And I said, by the way, how's your pandemic forecast going? And they said, what pandemic forecast? And uh, as I said, well, you need to talk to Jerry Glenn and you know, get something going. And Michael Kleeman, who's on the Red Cross, one of their boards, is a friend. And we were talking and said, gee, the Red Cross really needs what you're talking about. Would you do a project for the Red Cross? And I said, call Ted and Jerry and, and we'll throw something together. Uh, so that's how it happened. Um, my outside take was Red Cross as an organization just didn't know what to do with it. They are so focused on you know, responding to disasters that Culturally, uh, while there were individuals in it who absolutely loved it, they just didn't know uh, what to do with it. Yeah, it's ironic that Fauci's office used it more. <laughs> yeah. But although, in all fairness to Cleman, I think he said he was gonna, they're going to use uh, one of the scenarios for one of the retreats. Now, I don't know if they, are, they already did that or not for their planning yeah. retreat. Yeah. So they may have, they may have. Uh, Peter Rothman made a couple of comments yes. in the chat function. Peter, would you like to uh, uh, repeat your questions and comments? Peter, just unmute yourself. Sure. Go ahead. Um, well, I was actually just responding to something uh, Brian Alexander said about um, in the chat, sort of about vaccine hesitation. And I think uh, there was a recent poll, which I don't, I can't remember if it was Pew. I don't remember. Maybe Brian remembers. Uh, but we were talking about it on Facebook, I believe. And um, I think about half the people in that poll that hadn't gotten vaccinated or some percentage around 50 percent. 40. I don't know. I don't recall. Said not I'm not hesitant. I'm just not going to get it. Zero chance. And the people that I personally know. Um, who haven't got vaccinated. Um, unfortunately, that's exactly what they're saying. Like, no, not hesitation. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not going to do it. Um, and so, um, I wonder uh, how many minds are being changed. Uh, the Fox News thing was brought up and uh, if you look at the data after the next day or two, which, well, we're only a few days after that now, but I mean, it has the vaccination. It's not like the vaccination rate suddenly skyrocketed after a few people on Fox uh, sort of softened their position, sort of, and then not really. And they go on the podcast version and say the exact opposite of what they said on the broadcast and things like that. So they're not really reversing their position. And yeah, also... I'll I didn't I'll see any you. evidence of it having an effect. I, I'm going I'll first, Jerry. Bet. I'll take you a bet that there will be an impact over the course of a month because one of the things you're getting on a lot of news shows across the board, including uh, Fox's stuff, uh, they'll interview somebody in a hospital saying, boy, did I make a mistake. You know, don't you make the same mistake I did. It takes a while to, you know, when people have hardened positions, it's a while for that to unthaw. 
Sure. That doesn't thaw in one or so, two days. I mean, that, that's so, a, a month. That's not a new story. I'll, I'll take a $10 bet. It'll Jerry, I'm just piece. dying to jump in here. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Peter, two things. I want to get back to an early earlier post you did in the chat. But to your point now, there's a circle of my friends where we have a phrase uh, when something happens and it's two boats in a helicopter. Does anybody, right. does that ring a bell for anybody here? Two boats in a helicopter. Oh. Um, it's about the guy who uh, it's down in New Orleans and there's a flood and the water is rising and it's risen up over the sidewalk into the front of his house. And he said, oh, my God. And he says, well, God, save me. And a guy on a boat goes past. He says, hop in. I'll save you. And he says, no, 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 I'm fine. God's going to save me. And so the boat goes on. And uh, then it, the water rises and he's, you know, it's up to the second floor. And another boat comes past. He says, no, no, I don't need a ride. God's going to save me. And then, of course, he ends up on the roof. And a helicopter swings in low and says, here, jump in. We'll save you. And he says, no, no, I'm fine. God will save me. <laughs> of course, he drowns. And he arrives at heaven. And he goes up to God. And he said, what's with this? I believed in you. And you didn't save me. And God goes, save you. Save I sent you two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Well, you know, this highlights a bigger problem, disinformation. And that's the uh, topic that we're studying on the TechCast site right now, disinformation. So if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, you ought to, because that's another great study that we're doing. As, so, Einstein, yeah, said, yeah. as Einstein said, the difference between genius and stupidity is that genius has its limits. <laughs> right. we're kind of we're we've just got got on a roll here but we are up against the end of our of our allotted time so i think we're gonna have to to close it up um so thank you so much to our speakers uh as you know and you can look at the comments uh the audience definitely appreciates everything and this has been fantastic uh thank you again to steve hausman um steve will we will and and jerry the, you, you've given us the slides. Can we make these slides available to the sure. members of the audience who are here in attendance? And, sure. um, and Steve, is that possible that, that we'll be able to send them out? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can okay. put it on, on. I can send out a link to everybody <clears throat> sub after the meeting. I can put it on a box account and uh, send a link so they can look at them. Are you I also agree. able to send it to people who signed up but weren't able to come on? I can send it to everybody. Okay. In fact, I, that's actually the only way I can send it out. <laughs> good. Okay. I uh, I looked up an answer to a question that I couldn't uh, provide earlier. The negative scenario had a forecast in it of 600,000 deaths in the U.S. by January 2022. Mm -hmm. So Ted was not negative well, enough. You can see that. Not negative enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So anyway, uh, and in that uh, email that Steve's going to send everybody, uh, we would really appreciate your thoughts and ideas about future sessions. This has been our second session. The, the both sessions have been great. We just want to make sure, should, you know, what your thoughts are, our audience members, uh, should we continue them? Is there something else we should be doing? Uh, we, we'd love, so we'll send a, a brief survey, follow-up survey. We would va very much value getting your inputs on that, and then we'll pass the results along back to you. So stay tuned to, to us for more. Um, all right, this concludes today's forum. Everybody, thank you so much. Everybody stay safe, and let's keep working together to co-create a safe and prosperous future for all. Thank you, and goodbye, yep. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you to the organizers, too. You're welcome. It was great having